Let's go back to Exodus. <clears throat> hang on just a second. Hang on, hang on. Exodus 13. I don't mind the man. Exodus 13. Turn that down a little. <clears throat> Exodus 13. So we left off there last week. Um, basic guidance. And uh, so on the graphic, you know, a whole bunch of roads, if you've been to this place or not, but it's the typical uh, inner city stuff. Um, the, the question, so many roads, which one is the right one? <clears throat> and we use that kind of as an analogy. Uh, again, we uh, read Exodus uh, 13, verses 17 to the end of the chapter, which is just a few verses last week. We'll do it again. Um, and then I sort of uh, mentioned last week that we need more time to get through this. We may need another, well, we'll need another week. So I'll just go ahead and say it. Um, just really, really interesting. Uh, on the subject of guidance, you know, if you restrict your study to that. <clears throat> so when Pharaoh, verse 17, 13, 17, Exodus, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road through the Red Sea. By the way, that whole quotation, uh, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. God said that. So either somebody asked the question and he answered, or he just flat out said, gave his reason. Since when does God have to give a reason to do anything? I think it's just interesting. I see little things like that. Um, <clears throat> The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. Um, he had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. And after leaving Succoth, they, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. And by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So think of physical roads. So there's some pictured for you on the screen in front of you, but think of physical roads uh, as actual options, right? Um, what causes us to filter out all the other roads and options? So I'm thinking about this driving, driving home uh, the other day, thinking, so many roads. Why don't I take this one? Why don't I take that one? Why don't I want to? Because it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple answer why you don't. But still, when you think of this analogy, so many options in life, why these? Why choose this particular one? Um, so of all the other options, you filter those out, you choose to follow this one, uh, you remain on this particular path, and, uh, and you rule out all the others. So it's an interesting analogy, just to sort of plant in the mind. So I'll suggest that this is because, I mean, we do this, we filter these out, because we begin with a destination, right? So I'm traveling, I'm going home. This is all super intuitive and simple. But we should understand it in terms of God's guidance. You, know, you begin with a destination. The destination might permit multiple routes. So for those of you that use the Google Maps, something like that, you can scroll up with it and it'll give like three or four. This is the fastest. This is without tolls. This is whatever. You know, and you can, you can choose, pick and choose multiple routes, but you, you don't select a different destination you know, for the same routing. Um, so you begin with this destination in, in mind. Some of those possible routes might be easier, some more difficult, but uh, e easier, let's say, less costly, uh, maybe uh, more difficult and costly, maybe. Um, but this was the case with the Israelites. For example, in verses 17 and 18, God didn't lead them one way, but he led them another way. So note a few things from that just by observation one. God had predetermined the destination. Not from this particular passage, but we'd have to go back, right, in the context and say um, they were on their way to the promised land through the wilderness, you know, in, from, through, and to. You could do the whole story with 
four prepositions. So God had predetermined the destination. God had provided the opportunity by delivering his people from Pharaoh's oppression. Three, God had designed a route to the promised land. Designed, specifically with all these obstructions and things in the path along the way, God would provide for every contingency um, that would arise. So the journey to the promised land, uh, I would suggest, is bookended. That might be a strange term for you. Uh, in Scripture, when you are you know, reading a particular, at least I look for bookends. They're not always there, but it is interesting when they are there. You know bookends, physical bookends. They keep so your books don't go you know, on the top of your shelf. But in Scripture, it's like almost like brackets around a section. And so what do I see in terms of this in, from, to, and through? Uh, it's rather bookended, at least this point of um, being redeemed from Egypt and then uh, heading on to the, the promised land. I mean, what things could we say were bookended? Two, two, two significant impositions to the way forward. Okay, so here's, you've, you've been uh, tasked by God to follow this path, but now you're going to start you're going to start with a major imposition, you know, like a brick wall. You're going to start with a brick wall, and you're going to end with a brick wall. And everything in between is going to be impossible, right? So, yeah, let's do that. So the first, where they start, is where? The Red Sea. And we see this in terms of chapter 13 and 14. They're blocked by the Red Sea, an obstacle made even greater, even greater. Okay, so it's one thing to be blocked. You know, it's one thing to be at a brick wall. It's another thing to have some crazy pharaoh with all his chariots bearing down on you. Now you add to the blockage a degree, not of difficulty, but a degree of urgency. We've got to get through here or else we die. So this is the scenario that God set up for his people. And you have to think about that. God doesn't select these people because they're his favorites and somehow... Um, he's going to work this way with them. This is just how God works, isn't it? Um, what about the other end of it? What about the other end of it? Now you look at not just the start, but the completion. And of course, it gets easier and easier and easier. They go out into the wilderness needing how many train car loads of water, how many train car loads of firewood and all this, how many train car loads of food and all this stuff. So it just gets easier and easier, doesn't it? Until finally it just gets so easy at the end that they just cross the finish line. Wow, I've run enough marathons to know it doesn't get easier as you go, and crossing that finish line, it's like, oh, it's over. Uh, but the completion now, if you fast forward 40 years, now it's not the Red Sea, but it's what the Jordan River, right? And to add further, the Jordan River, although difficult and impossible to cross with this nation, now 40 years even more developed, what else do they have staring at them that they can see over the horizon? Now, this is interesting if you put the sandals on and actually stand there and look. You're standing at the swelling fords of the Jordan. You're able to see over that, and what do you see in the distance on the horizon is ancient Jericho. There's Jericho with its fortified walls, a garrison city for what reason? It is situated there in this part of the trans, not the Transjordan, but it would be the Transjordan from this side, um, situated there, why? It's to say anyone who dares cross and enter, any intruder, you're going to have to get by Jericho or else. So now you have two. Now, prior to that, you have the Red Sea, and then, wow, even if we get through here, we've got to survive the wilderness. So even if we get through here, we've got to overcome. There's no circling around Jericho. You know, we've got to go straight through it. Does anybody see what I see in this scenario, right? So, do you ever have one of those sitting right in front of you? And you say, oh God, not that. No, no, not that. If only I could turn around and go back the other way. If only I could scoot back around. But I have to go through it. Straight through it. So, here's the thing that God, by his miraculous intervention and his unconventional means. And those two things might go together, but I like separating them, right? Miraculous intervention, unconventional means, 
Because it'd be one thing to expect God to do a miracle, but it's another thing to, to presuppose what that miracle would be. And how many times do we say, oh God, I need a miracle? Is that a casting crown? No, that's the third day, something. <laughs> oh God, I need a miracle. But then you tell God exactly what it is that you need, what he needs to do, which might seem to be a miracle to you, and he does something altogether different. Um, so, unconventional means across the Jordan, unconventional means to defeat uh, the armies prior to that. Okay? So, think about the bookends again. What did God do prior to the Red Sea in order to convince the people that the Red Sea was really not an obstacle if God was with them? And you look at the plagues by which he brought Pharaoh to his knees and all this stuff, right? Right? So what did God do now at the end prior to the crossing of the Jordan to demonstrate to the people that the God who could do this is the God who can not only enable them to cross the swelling fords of the Jordan, but also defeat the armies of Jericho, right? So here they're defeating the armies in the Transjordan, people who were ill-equipped for war, so on and so forth. It's really quite amazing how these parallel each other, but bookends, bookends. Generally, uh, when you're thinking bookends um, in terms of interpreting scripture, I'm just saying this is not necessarily an interpretive scheme. It's more of a literary device in some books. But in this case, generally when you identify bookism, books, uh, sorry, bookends, it's like, it's like a, in literary circles you call it a merism, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth as those are two separate things, but it's also everything in between. You know, as though God accounted for these two ends of the continuum, but it's also inclusive of whatever's in between. So it's like if God could do the greater of the two, he certainly is capable of doing the lesser. Now that's Pauline theology, by the way. When you get into studying Paul, you understand that Paul always argues from the greater to the lesser. He always magnifies God for who he is, And then says, well, here's all these lesser things, right? If God is this, if God be for us, who can be against us? All right, too much information. Um, So we say God takes us through not removing the obstacles into the promised land. This is what he did with the people of God. But he does so with his help. um, And then... It's all over, you know, once you get to the promised land. (coughs) Not the easy part. We got to the destination, and you realize it's a reboot. Let's set it up all over again. Now you've got to dispossess. You know, this this isn't like the Wild West. This is is a well-populated area. As a matter of fact, there's five cities, five cities, five cities, and these are, you could divide up the conquering of of the promised land, in, in a tripartite way, in three ways, um, in these campaigns. So much work to be done. Okay, so let's just back up a step. So for many Christians, many people, they think in terms of guidance. Um, so if God is leading, everything will be smooth. There won't be any obstacles. There won't be any complications. And you, you and I know there's enough people that start down a path and the minute they hit an obstacle, they'd say, well, if God was in this, that obstacle wouldn't be there. Things would just be smooth sailing and uncomplicated. Uh, And they think, well, the right road for me, the right road for me then is the one without obstacles because if there are barriers, it must be that God is telling me I'm going in the wrong direction. Right? But how does that square with, say, for example, a New Testament passage like James chapter 1? Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, as though trials are consistent with God's leading, because you know that the testing of your faith, so in other words, there's a plan, a purpose to the trials, produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing, so on and so on and so on. 
But what if you take the path of least resistance? I mean, what if that's your interpretation of guidance? Guidance equals the path of least resistance, the path that doesn't have any problems, the path that's free of complications, and so on and so on and so on. Wow. It doesn't seem to square with how God works. So we see from a passage like this, this demonstrates generation after generation of how God worked with his people Israel, um, God not only gives a promise, but he reveals a destination. And so what's key to guidance and getting your guidance system straight is you begin with the, the destination. In other words, a work. Now that destination doesn't have to be a physical location, but a work that God will accomplish in our lives to reveal his presence, his power, his provision, his protection, and to build our faith to exalt him in the eyes of the unbelieving. How are unbelievers going to... Re Do you think unbelievers are just going to grab on to the truth because you tell them the gospel and somehow it's self-evident to them? It's intuitive to them and makes sense? That gospel has to be wrapped in a context and that context is going to be your life. They want to see if this is a, if it's a living truth or if it's just dead orthodoxy. It's a living truth means it's wrapped up in your life and what God is doing in your life. How is God being exalted in your pain, in your trial, and so on? So the road to the destination is a succession of faith requiring obstacles to pass through. So we said, well, it's the Red Sea. It's where are they going to get water? Where are they going to get food? These are not small things, by the way. And then to enter land that is occupied by how many of those tribes? Have you ever read those verses that contain all the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites and all these different kind of ites, all the tribes? Those are people that possess the land. None of them friendly. All of them will, with, with um, uh, great desire, defend their borders and their territory uh, within the land. Um, And so military campaigns to come, the job isn't finished just because you arrive there. Um, so we can also be assured that there are always, and this is, I think, interesting, uh, lest we, okay, if you're like me, then you'll complain about the obstacles. You, know, you just sit there and say, I don't like this, I don't like this, I wish this obstacle wasn't there. And you say, God, I have to go through <laughs> that I get it, it's with your help, with your grace, uh, but still, um, and you start learning after a while, you know, to just say, yes, I will, <laughs> okay. But take a step back from that and get some perspective and think um, there are a lot more threats to the way forward and a lot more obstacles to the way forward. It's just God has chosen these among them to put in your path. I mean, what if God were like you and I, and we complained, you know, and said, I don't like that. Well, okay, great. I'll pick a couple more for you. Let's see how you like those. See, he has sovereignly appointed these particular, let's say, threats or these particular obstacles um, and not those <coughs> obstacles. So consider all the possible detours that may seem frustrating. So this can be confusing to people who are less than trusting in God. You start down a path, you're sure of this path, you have great confidence in this path, but then the obstacles, you get through the first obstacle, that's fine. You get through the second obstacle, that's fine, but you're still going through it because it's on the path. But now, right in front of you is your favorite <coughs> sign. How many of you like those detours, right? So you're going along and you're looking and thinking, but, you know, I, I have this much time and I'm making good progress. I think I'm going to make, and then detour, detour, right? And so we could think, oh, no, I'm going to take a wrong turn. Oh, no, this is inconsistent somehow with, with God's will. And yet it is for that reason that God has said I'll not lead you this way, lest seeing war you'll turn back, but I'm going to lead you this way. And if you look at 13 verses 17 and 5, this is exactly what the Israelites thought, 
they went out, what does it say? Ready for battle. Why? Because they, they, they knew the route. They knew the route. Any reasonable person is going to go through Philistine territory. These people are warriors. We're going to have to trust God that he leads us and gives us the victory in battle and how wrong they got it. I mean, they were theologically correct, but they were practically wrong. So God took them the other way. Who goes that way? Seriously. I mean, you can Google this region. It hasn't changed. Nobody's developed it. There's not hotels and whatever. This is as desolate a ground as there is, and you're not going across it. You're not, you're going, you're going to take the longest route around the southern dip and all the way across here. It is absolutely amazing. But God had determined this path for them. So we get frustrated along the way. We get confused along the way, confounded. Uh, we start to doubt uh, our guidance, our routing, and our guide. That's why, to me, it's interesting that God disclosed his reason. Did he do that to Moses? Well, Moses writes it down here. So it is interesting to think why. He doesn't have to, but he did. So we want to get to this destination to have all of this stuff to be over. Remember, they send the spies out. It's a land flowing with milk and honey and these people. Think about it, though. Think about it. And you say, all right, we get it. There's food there. Think where they're hearing this. They've been eating this manna for 40 years. They, they've had the same diet. How many days in a row can you eat this? Now, I'm not saying the same diet, like you eat the same thing for breakfast, the same thing for lunch, the same thing for, I've, I've done that for, did that for a long time, not so much anymore. Did that for a long time. Same thing. Same, same, same meal, same identical, same. Oh, geez. Same, same, same. But you got sick in your mind. No, not really. <laughs> now, what I'm saying is different. I mean the same food, breakfast, supper. If you ate three times a day, they're probably not eating three times a day like that, but the same type of thing, right? Um, so they're thinking now, or they should be thinking, they're going to enter a land, they're going to be blessed because they're going to dwell in houses that they didn't build, they're going to reap crops that they didn't plant, they're going to harvest vineyards that they didn't cultivate, all, all of these things, right? Um, just get to the destination and all this could be over. But now the journey is going to be longer. There'll be more difficulty because God takes them on this detour. He takes them on a completely different route. Um, but God was sparing them from some obstacles in favor of others because he knows which ones are the right ones for us. Isn't that what James says? He says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into various kinds of trials, right? Trials appointed just for you. And the idea of falling there is in this kind of a hole that you can't climb out of. It doesn't mean that you trip and fall and pick yourself up. But you have one of these falls that you hit the bottom and there's no way out but to, but to look up. And so God is going to put them in this kind of a situation uh, to learn something more about him, all that we know. So let's stop thinking of the destination in terms of a time and place. We're going to get there then, but it's going to be there someplace. For them, it was this promised land, but even for them, the destination wasn't a land. That might sound strange. Um, we should think of the destination in terms of our conduct, our character, our spiritual formation, our complete surrender to God. For example, uh, and in many ways, uh, it's intended, the book of Hebrews, to parallel um, 
much of what uh, Moses is describing here. We can follow it in the early chapters of, of Hebrews. Uh, but in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, it says this, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later. So the whole intention, the destination was rest, not a land. It wasn't where they would be. It was in how they would live in this place. Um, the whole journey across the wilderness was to produce in them the conduct, the character, the behavior, the trust in God. How do we know that? Um, well, I flip back to Deuteronomy 8. Be careful to follow every, every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land. What are they supposed to learn before they enter and possess the land? Remember how the Lord God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order to know what is in your heart, whether they humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, and neither you or your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live by what bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Just trust me. So this was the whole the whole point of the whole thing, and this is what um, the writer of Hebrews is saying here that there re there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's a cessation, right? It's a cessation of all my striving and struggling and worrying, and it's a complete abandonment to God. But where are you going to learn that unless you're in circumstances that are going to induce all of that fear and anxiety and pain and, and emotional uh, duress and all those types of things so that we can discover who we are in order to discover um, who he is? So we have to think in these terms with regard to the destination. So what's the writer of, of Hebrews saying? Why is he using the ancient crossing of this wilderness and entrance into the land by the Israelites as a picture of the Christian life? Because it's possible that you could enter into the land, the spiritual location of God's perfect care, and not have the rest that the journey should have prepared you to enjoy. And isn't that what the writer of Hebrews is saying? Sure, people went in there, but they, they misunderstood that the land was the destination instead of a relationship with God in the land, how they would live in the land in terms of rest and, and this whole sense of cessation of all of my struggles. So God wants us to live in a place, if you will, of complete reliance on him. I mean, that's the journey. It's all this metaphorical stuff, but it, it's spiritual. We can look at physical roads and all that, but the journey is to rest, is to obtain that kind of rest. Um, it's a spiritual condition. It's a place we arrive where we trust his, his presence, his power, his protection, his provision. So if you look back again at that, they were in Egypt. God took them from being in Egypt, from, in, from Egypt, into the wilderness, through the wilderness, to the promised land. And you think of it, you think of it like that. So coming out of Egypt is redemption. And what the writer of the book of Hebrews seems to be saying in correspondence to, let's say, a historical progression of the children of Israel is some type of post-redemption, uh, what do you call it, right? So I know the Lord, um, uh, I'm trusting in him for my salvation, but I'm not at that place of rest. Or is rest just immediate? Rest is just conferred upon you at salvation. There it is, boom. You come out of the gate perfectly trusting God in every aspect of your life. I don't see that. But you have this post-redemption kind of sense of having to be broken. You need broken before him. Because we don't die to self easily. So broken, devoid of ourselves, certain of God that he's sufficient for all. Now go back to the wilderness and think, 
Isn't that the lesson? Isn't that, you know, let's just put you up against something that's absolutely impossible, like getting out from under Pharaoh's oppression, breaking the yoke of the most powerful monarch in the world. And then you think, whew, that's done, great. Out of there, you get to the next impossible, right? So after a while, you're learning that this God, well, he really can do these things, but they're sort of standing there as spectators, aren't they? It's like many people can read this, read this book and just be spectators and not participants. I mean believers. You can read it, you can know all the details, you can connect all the dots, but you're a spectator because you're not realizing it in your own life. Spectator. That's what they did. But they saw the great miracles of God. They saw him part the Red Sea. They saw him rain manna down. You know, they saw him do all of these things and care for them, and yet they never entered into rest. Only a precious few. You think of Joshua, Caleb, and maybe, maybe some others. It should have just been broken. And so it, if you had to devise a plan by which you would be broken, what would it look like? But what path would you choose so that you could say, I want that path because it's going to break me? Number one, nobody would choose it. You just wouldn't. You know, we intuitively go for the path of least resistance. You know, James is telling people that have just been dispersed from their homeland, everything that's familiar to them, they're strangers and vagabonds wandering in the world. Nothing's certain in their life. And he's saying, you know what? This is the best position to be in with God because he's going to teach you to walk by faith and not by sight. What kind of path would you choose so that you could be absolutely certain of God. I mean, what if God held us to everything we said or thought about him, everything we claimed about him, you know, as being, God, you are this, you are that. You know, I think of Abraham. Abraham planting all the, these terebinth trees, and here's a whole grove of evergreens that's going to be a lasting monument to the life-giving God. And this is Abraham's purpose, because I believe in you, you're the life-giving God. And then God says what? Take your son, your only son, the son that you love. I mean, is that a path that Abraham would have chosen? Hey, I know what, God, this is what I think I need to do. I need to take my son, the very basis of the covenant, we waited and waited and waited, and finally, miraculously, we have this child, and now I'm going to sacrifice it on an altar. Right? These, are, these aren't things that we would choose, and I'm just suggesting that there is not an inconsistency because the path that you're on happens to be difficult. It happens to be crooked. You can't see what's up ahead. You don't know even what's coming, but you do, like that cloud before you, have God who's promised to stay with you, and you keep your eyes on him. It really doesn't matter does it? Whether it's uphill or down or through and through, you're saying, I know God, I know, I know. Your desire is quite simple that you just want to break me so that I'll be certain not where my next meal's coming from, not where, where my next dollar's coming from, not how I'm going to pay my bills, not what my health is going to be, but I'm certain of who you are. Because once I'm certain of who you are, nothing else, nothing else really matters. And who he is, is sufficient for all. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, and then again in chapter 29 of Deuteronomy. And then Jesus mentions this, man shall not live. Remember, he's quoting this when he's being tempted of Satan in the wilderness. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's, it's that simple. It's that simple. And he uses the, 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 the base, you know, bread, as though I can't live without that, you know. So the journey is really from redemption to rest. Um, theirs was a duration of 40 years, and we know why. Um, but how long does it have to be before we're broken, we're convinced, we're certain that God is sufficient? I don't mean what we believe. What we believe is like, I mean, what do you do with that? What do you do? To me, it's so neutral. You've got like what you believe, and I'm like, okay, okay. But how is that 
translated into what you do, who you are as a person? How has that transformed your character? How has that made you who you are? So what you believe is just a set of, and you can ground it in scripture and it's all great. You can assent, in other words, you can have a census, you can assent and say it's all true, but if it is, does your actual life comport with it? And that's the disconnect. And that's much of scriptures dedicated to that, right? Um, I remember years ago when we lived in, <coughs> lived in Dallas, um, uh, attending a church there, and I, I can remember whoever was speaking that day uh, was talking about this situation of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, and he says, when you murmur and complain, you'll wander, and you'll wander, and you'll wander, and you'll wander. I said, how true that is. Um, so how long? How long will, will we wander? How long will we do that? How long will we live kind of in the wilderness when God wants us to have this rest. Imagine if they came to that point of rest prior to entering into the land. Imagine if they allowed all of that 40 years to be broken, to enter into the land absolutely convinced. The Jordan would have been nothing. Jericho would have, would have been nothing. The inhabitants of the land would have been nothing. They would never have left little deposits of people when God said, they're to be wiped out, as grotesque as that might sound to the modern mind, to any mind. Um, when you read Deuteronomy 8 and Deuteronomy 29, you'll find that there was even a division among the people. There was a division. You had this mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. There were people that were sort of like, you know, um, let's, let's get out while the getting's good. <laughs> let's go with those people and follow them. But sooner or later, it came to be revealed that these were people that were not um, God-fearing people. I think Hebrews is going to bear that out too, possibly, if you interpret Hebrews that way. You, you, you can. You know, for certainly First John says that there was a group of people that were among us, and then they were out, were, out, were went out from us, and, you know, this, this kind of language. Um, so a whole bunch of roads, original question, which one is the right one? We can claim redemption, sure. We can know the destination, but where's the rest? Not the rest of it, but the rest that God wants for us. Um, the right path is the one on which you are certain. God gives us certainty. Obstacles are a guarantee, but if there's opposition to it, God will get you through it, if you can remember it that way. Um, don't be concerned about opposition. Um, I think I've said before, the door of opportunity swings on the, <laughs> the hinges of opposition. It's, it's just that way. And God intends to, to break us, to convince us of 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 who he is. Uh, don't be afraid of impossible. If you're going to do the impossible, you live by the invisible. It's another one of these things stuck in my head. Another one stuck in my head with God, the best place and the worst place at the same place. But the key is with God. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, a, a similar sentiment. Um, so, so begin to rethink the, the road that you're on, rethink the destination, and rethink the purpose for, for traveling this. God wants to break us. God wants us to be absolutely certain of who he is. He wants to change. I just warn you, though, that the older that you are, the least likely you're going to, the more likely you're going to rationalize, and the least likely you are to make any type of deliberate sort of, of change or relinquish, you know, these certain uh, ways that perhaps you, you become conditioned. Uh, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, some small insights into uh, what you did in and through your people. Um, so I have to think, as I look uh, at my own set of circumstances, um, how that 
really relates. Uh, and uh, all of us have been, have been centrally located in a situation where if we're on the right path, doing the right thing, we'd have to brand it impossible. You've put something there that is absolutely impossible uh, for us to circumvent, to climb over, to go through without your help. Uh, and we should, we should revel in that. We should glory in that. Um, thank you for those obstacles because you're trying to teach us rest. You're trying to teach us to abandon all the worries and doubts and fears and frustrations and all those things and understand that circumstances are really neutral to the fact that we are to trust you and to trust you completely. Circumstances are the things we put our eyes upon, but you are the one in whom we trust and we can reverse that so easily. So thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Uh, bless us throughout the remainder of the day, the week to come. Uh, thank you that you are not shy about showing us your mighty hand and stepping in and, and, and helping and doing all those unconventional and unexpected things. And, and thank you, Lord, that you, you preserve us, you protect us, you, you provide for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.